So I think she, uh, about um about a year she's been having back backache, and her claudication became worse. Like she can't even bend, and uh, um, it was just uh, and radiating pain and all that. So, so mostly back. So we did, we, yeah, back pain, yeah, back pain, and going down the legs. No radiculopathy. Yeah, no, she has, she had, yeah, bilateral. Bilateral. What so, would you say was the radiculopathy? L five, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, but um, um, and then we just did X ray and then MRI and then we took it from there. So let me see if I have now the pre op. Uh, X-ray. I want to share the pre-op. Um, the actually the MRI or CAT scan. That was CAT scan, right? You sent me a CAT scan. Pre-op was MRI. Post-op was CT. Yeah. Let me just get it here. So here, this is uh, back pain worse than the leg pain. Yeah. 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 Okay. Think, yeah. So here, that's quite significant. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. The spondyloptosis there. Yeah. Well, this is at least a grade three, right? Grade three, yeah. Yeah. So aren't you surprised that uh, this patient back pain and leg pain? What about weakness? I mean, no, 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 no weakness. No weakness. I'm surprised. Yeah. Surprised? She can walk. Surprised? Yeah. Sam, why yeah. do you think? This patient just have back pain and leg pain, but no weakness, no truly severe neurologic deficit. Why, why do you think it is? I think it's is, she, is she moving on uh, Flex X? I mean, uh, I would assume if she's fused or depending on the CT, then she might not be uh, having weakness. I mean, if she's fused, but it doesn't look like she's fused on the MRI. I mean, that's horrible. Uh, if if but I assume she's going to move on flex X. I don't know. That's surprising. That's surprising. But, you know, we are neurosurgeons, okay? There is no orthopedic surgeon here, so we can a little trash them, right? One's coming in now, Hamid. Hold oh, on. Don't start oh, talking okay. shit now. <laughs> I, I, I got one coming in. Okay. okay. Well, how often, how often do you do a craniotomy? You see an arachnoid cyst, and the arachnoid cyst itself has made an impression in the bone, in the skull. How often do you see that? Arachnid suits, right? Low pressure, nothing. Really, yeah. lowest pressure you can. But, you know, and then you get... Hi, hi, Bob. Hello, how are you, Hamid? Good, good. We just were about to trash orthopedic surgeon, but now we can't anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, how often do we go do a craniotomy on a patient who has some pathology that is really not really severe, like something low pressure, but then we see the bone in the skull so forms, so literally is plastically form around it if it happens over years and years, right? Yeah. So even a soft tumor, even a, like a something low pressure, surprisingly, if it happens over years and years, the bone, they form around soft structure. Now, obviously, if something like that happened in a trauma and acutely, this patient will lose practically everything L5 and below, right? That's what we would expect. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But That's a slow here, process. Yeah. yeah, but here, you see, and that is why when people look at this, and now, now let's be very clear about that. This is the point I'm trying to make. This probably took about five to ten years to happen. What do you think, Tony? How, how long? Yeah. Did, yeah. What? Well, well, yeah, I know. Now and as well, deformity as well, things to that nature. All, all this uh, severe deformity. It takes them years to happen, and you we are surprised that how little neurological deficit these patients have. And then, um, somebody wants to go in one hour and make that picture look perfect, make picture look, make that spondylolisthesis completely go away. Now, um, as we know, when something happens over a very long period, not only the nerve, but as well, the vessels around the nerve and everything else 
deforms in a longer period of time and they become literally elongated. Um, now, I'm not sure if you guys know, but uh, at the time that we were, there is a reason now we do all this neuromonitoring and so on, because in a long time ago, they would do a perfect surgery, reduce a scoliosis and deformity beautifully. Picture look perfect, patient wake up and they're paralyzed. Everybody has heard of those stories, right? And I no, think- I, I, I had a loss of uh, um, L5S1. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, okay. And the and the and the guy's like bilateral. I'm like, okay. Now I need to not reduce so much. I need to stop the reduction. And 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 then he said, oh, by, by the way, also the hands have gone as well. I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so 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 when the hands go and the legs go, then you know it's something, something else. else. It's something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. So, so see, I didn't take it seriously. Yeah. In the yeah. time in the time that we didn't have neuromonitoring. Yeah. And what we do is we do nature make it in 10 years look like that. You go in half an hour, try to make it from grade three to zero. And mm -hmm. then nine out of 10 times is not even, you know, that you're pushing on the nerves. You are creating a vascular kink or vascular injury that then causes additional neurological deficit. And if you don't have neuromonitoring, you don't know it, you do a beautiful surgery, you pay, picture looks perfect, perfect. Patient wakes up, they have lost function. And now these days with neuromonitoring, that happens there not as often. But this is what I am advocating that, you know, um, I, the goal should be a gentle correction, not a aggressive correction. Right. Because again, this didn't happen over, over the night, right? Yeah. Now, uh, tell us about this case now. So, you, oh, yeah. so tell, tell us from the beginning to the end. I want to know how did you do the surgery post op? Yeah. I have some more pictures. I uh, let me share uh, other pictures. Now, this is the post op. I want to share the other pre op. So, um, we went, um, we were debating how to do it, and I think the only way we could get a a uh, easier correction would be to go uh, anterior first. Yeah. So we organized it with the vascular surgeon and we did a fan and steel small incision, went retroperitoneal and take um, just the lower part of the L5, mm -hmm. like a cop copectomy and go all the way down. And then uh, I had, uh, it was it's quite difficult because I started using, I was using the microscope, then I just, I took the microscope away. I could complete it faster. No, and then uh, if I if I, I want to understand it really well here. Now, yeah, yeah. Um, you and I we talked about that. Now, uh, yeah. you know, some people would argue if you really want to do this, first you have yeah. to, if it's not mobile, you have to go and release the posterior tension, like do facetectomy, then yeah, yeah. feed anterior, do the you know a lift. Then turn yeah. it back, finish it with posterior instrumentation. So did you start it posteriorly in a prone position posteriorly? No, I started anterior. No, so you start anteriorly. So you did the A yeah. first. A yeah. Um do you use a vascular surgeon or orthopedic surgeon or uh, I'm sorry, a All, surgeon? always okay. always vascular surgeon vascular oh. surgeon. So um you know the, the, how hard was for him to give you the exposure? It took it took him some time, uh, I think. Uh, but um, it's not it's not pretty it's not difficult for them because they do more. Yeah. I think, difficult vascular exposure. So. Do you mean by some time, like an hour or two hours? I think it took two hours. Yeah. Two hours. Okay. Mm. So um, and obviously with this uh, not quite significant severe anatomy, I uh, yeah. rather than taking their time, and. Um, um, uh, uh, Sam, uh, have you done, you know, have you been there when they do the opening for the A-lift? Have you seen how it goes? I haven't done much A-lifts uh, recently in my fellowship, but I've done in my residency. I have, yeah. And uh, we had like a vascular surgeon would really take like an hour for exposure for uh, chip shot cases. 
wasn't very impressed by by uh, by them at that time. Uh, I'm actually I have a three level A lift on Monday. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this will be like my first year in my 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 fellowship, so we'll see how that goes. No, what I'm what I'm trying to refer to. Now, obviously, um, iliac but arteries and veins they almost separate at uh, L4. L4. It's around maybe mm -hmm. a little above L4. They separate. When they come mm -hmm. down, they are still together. There is like a V there. You know, mm -hmm. I did about 150 ALIF. And one of my thing was I was with a surgeon, general surgeon. He was out of extraordinary good at that. It took him mm -hmm. 20 minutes to give me the exposure. Now, what we looked at, uh, Tony, it is not a 20 minute exposure. It's a longer exposure. And I'm going to yeah. tell you why. If you have the chance, Sam, Go in, scrub in, look at the anatomy, let him see what he's doing. What yeah. so I got really good at it. I could do it myself, but I still for medical legal reason I let them do that. But often as well, I did that and he was there. Okay. So the so the um the iliac crest uh is obviously here at the around the L4. And so um it, that that is why the only five S one is very only a ATP anterior to psoas five S one is very different than only uh, one to four, right? But iliac veins and arteries they separate. You are not worried much about iliac arteries. They are really tough. They, you can uh, move them around. They are fine. But iliac veins, that yeah, is the maybe. problem. And I think then God really hated the spine surgeon. Why? Because those iliac veins, when they come down, yeah. see almost you see a small little fascia like a plane. There are four vessels. Each iliac vein has two vessels that they penetrate this fascia, they go under the fascia, and then they go down. Guess what? If you try to coagulate them, if you try to touch them, it is behind the iliac vein they start bleeding. And if you try to coagulate them, oh my God, everything you do make that hole bigger. And that hole is behind the iliac vein. It's hard. That's what neurosurgeons do, coagulate the bipolar. And that is, that is <laughs> no, you have to find them no matter what. And you have to double, triple clip them on each side and you cut them. And then you can mobilize iliac vein. Don't worry about the artery. We all know you can beat the shit out of an artery and artery is okay, but not much the vein. And because those four penetrating, I don't even know what, if they have a name. Mm. They're always there. They're just but, uh, at there's the a name. This one. Yeah, please. Yeah. There's a left ilio, iliac. There, there, there is, it's a name. One of them has got a name. The left one is the one that bleeds the most. And I've got vascular surgeons who I operate, they do it in 30 minutes. And the ones that do fast, they always get that vein and they have to actually suture it. You know, and, and we have like 100 mils of blood loss in a second and then they Am suture I... that, that branch. Yeah. They suture that branch with, with proline. Yeah. That's the no, only way to. No, my vascular, my surgeon, they clip it, obviously. They clip it. What okay. they do, they, they go and find that. And it's a thin layer, but it is a. Uh, tough enough that you cannot pull around, you cannot mobilize, you cannot mobilize the iliac vein until you find that and dissect that. If you try to mobilize iliac vein, and the problem is you have to, in the 5S1, you have to move the iliac veins farther around. So they're like that, you have to farther around to have a big opening. In the 4, 5, even worse, but those veins that I was talking about, they take off at around 5S1. So if you have a chance, Sam, that's a good experience for you to understand the anatomy. Be there, right. see what they are doing. Now, even though the opening is smaller in 4-5, because when you're mobilizing 4-5, those, those branches are in 5S1, they are less out of the danger. Now, if when you get to three four, um, the, the, I I usually never did three four, um, alif because then you have to mobilize entire. You know you have to go 
um, mobilize the entire Iliac uh, uh, aorta and vena cava, um, it is doable, and good surgeon can do that. That's why ALIF ATP is better procedure at the three four two three one two than ALIF. And I don't know any people who do a two three or one two ALIF. Do you know anybody doing that, Tony? Yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah, we yeah, do yeah. three levels. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In 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 Johannesburg, I I had a patient who came there. Yeah, Johannesburg, uh, they did from like from L two three all the way down L. <laughs> but those are massive surgery. You cannot be retroperitoneal for that. Are they were they retroperitoneal for that? No, no. I I, I they they had a like a longitudinal like a straight scar submission. Sure, and yeah, you can't yeah. be. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, obviously, if you spill out all the organs, you can do what yeah. you want to do. I mean. <laughs> They do they do um, aortic uh, the, not uh, aneurysm surgery all the time and so on. It is yeah. all pending, but that is not anymore a regular ALF anymore. Where you are infra or retroperitoneal, you know, to go those levels like one, two, three, and then three, four, it is become harder to be infra or retroperitoneal. Then you are doing abdominal surgery. Practically. Okay, now we are talking about ALIF. Now, be, because of your, I'm going to show your picture again, Tony, here. See, over years, the, those iliac veins and so on, they have been stretched. How they are going, God knows how, in what orientation they are. So I don't mind the, uh, if you're going to do it the way you did, I don't mind the surgeon taking their time identifying uh, identifying those vessels and uh, coagulate them or uh, suture them or clip them properly. Now, because I have seen how they, those vessels bleed once you open it yeah. up. The first... What do you guys think about... Go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. So what, what do you guys think about like bilateral, like in my hands, probably the best thing probably to go posterior. I mean, because my goal is not like to do like 100% correction, bilateral facetectomies, PCOs, and try to pull as much as I can since yeah. she's not weak, basically. Yeah, very, very, very reasonable That's surgery. Fine. But if you do that, uh, you should go two level above, two level below. Not just, yeah. that, right? Because of the mechanics right, on that level is just way too much. Do you agree, Tony? Yeah, sure, yes. I, I, I have the previous case like this, I did like that. Yeah. Even put iliac screws and do up to around and uh, got um, got some correction. But and the patient is very happy. Uh, the previous oh. patient I did posterior. And so 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 if you ask me why I changed my tactic, you know, it's just that. No, no. Uh, coming back to the alif, um, yeah. You know, the alif is a, a access surgeon surgery, not a spine surgeon surgery. Once they give you access. The rest become, you know, trivial. But uh, have you guys seen this bleeding? You don't. I've want seen to... it once in my residency. It's pretty bad. No, no, it's pretty start, bad. It starts with a little oozing, and mm -hmm. then it just that oozing just doesn't stop. You do whatever you can do. You and then you, if if the vascular surgeon is inexperienced, um, I'm, obviously they should know better. They try to, if they try to coagulate it, this is not what you coagulate, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the worst you can do because we know from uh, sinuses, right? When you try to coagulate yeah. the sinus bleeding, the hole get bigger. It retracts, it, the hole get bigger. And then eventually it gets bigger and bigger and then you have a pool of blood there. You don't know where it's coming from. Um, and that is where, you know, really catastrophe can happen. But... Having said that, none of that happened with your case, Tony. So you, you, uh, um, was it quite mobile when you went anteriorly? And uh, they t tell us a little more detail. So you went and they, they need two hours to give you access. Then you go yeah. and t tell us yeah. what did you do next. Yeah. Uh, so then we did. Um, um, it was difficult to get around to the left part of the vertebral body, but the right I could see very nicely. Mm -hmm. And then I used um, ostrotome and then bone scapula to do that copectomy so that I could take that uh, end plate 
of the uh, thing off with a little bit of copectomy as well. You mean so you, you wanted? You are yeah, yeah, about here. yeah. Did you do a about uh, about? Did you just take that the edge of the bone the, off? Edge of the bone, the lower lower part. Sorry, that the edge. Uh, you know, so so uh, it's so uh, it's bone on bone. Yeah, and so obviously we had some bleeding from the bone. But that we could just, you know, just uh, put some diatomy directly on it, and it, uh, and when I used bone scalpel, it was much better. Yeah. And then uh, normal uh, disectomy, but I could not. Um, we went through partial of the S. Uh, where I found difficulty was the junction between L5 and S1, and to go into that and take that part of the disc because that's so far, mm -hmm. and that angle was so difficult because I tried to get the head down and feet up and all that so the, so the, so the microscope and everything to get a better angle but i think this this is uh, better done without microscope and using the using the uh, x ray as guidance because you usually can get somewhere else you know uh, yeah, yeah. and then and then and then uh, but we did take some part of the bone of s1 mm -hmm. and and then uh, totally from the front and back we had a cell say was your about 200 uh, mils of blood loss, which we gave 50 mils something back to the patient. So that's, that's pretty good. So I, how long did it take you to do the anterior part? Total? About two, two hours, yeah. Two hours, including yeah. your work or just yeah. your work. And then you yeah. need half an hour to turn, then you turn the patient, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then how long, did, yeah. how long does that usually take you to do? Uh, in, in our, uh, in South Africa, People are pretty chill, so it's an hour. <laughs> an hour to, can't force. So, uh, <laughs> so five hours. We are yeah. no two hours already, and one or three hours. Then you yeah. do posterior instrumentation, correct? Yeah. What level yes. Did you do it? What level did you do the instrumentation? Our, our initial plan was uh, just L five S one. How uh, Doctor Bob Gaines uh, has told in nineteen eighties, you know, uh, but. Um, uh, because I am, I wasn't happy with the reduction anteriorly, mm -hmm. and um, I could see it was very difficult also from the from the back posteriorly as well. Mm -hmm. So I just decided just just to take in L four screw as well, so that it'll be like a lever arm to to uh, you know. I always get it up. that. I always when I have a grade two or worse L five okay. on, I always yeah. went to L four, and there are multiple reasons for that. Okay. Um. Now, obviously, you know, you you. I think you had a good intuition, Tony. That, yeah. Uh, the, if you put the screws, if you just imagine the screws. As, as a matter of fact, I want to show it. Let me just show it. But can you tell me your consideration? To explain. Um. Your why did you decide to do L four and Sam? What would you do? Would you go the the How would you manage that? Uh, I would have done uh, posterior like L4 to pelvis and PCOs and try to pull it, uh, uh, pull the spondy when I'm uh, uh, tightening the uh, screw caps with the rod. Okay. Now, I I, I think that's a very the, the doable and val viable option. Honestly, I if the patient doesn't have much of a, you know, the, the neurological deficit and pain is the main problem, um. I I think you know the, you did a great job, Tony, to reduce it just the right amount. Mm -hmm. you, it is comparing this to the previous one. Um, I would say this is still grade two, but I yeah. can almost tell you for sure with very much confidence. If you would have tried to reduce it to any more than that, you would have created mm -hmm. neurological deficit. Mm -hmm. And look at that. This is what I mean. Imagine. Now, if you put just L5 and L4 screws, right? Your rod would look something like that. Is that correct? Yes. Whereas your weight, when you stand up, comes down this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now... Um, I, I, I wish we had one of our engineers here, but they can explain to you so much better. The force that you put on this rod and so on is so much more likely to fail than if you have... One more on top. 
yeah, one more top here. And then you put a you put a rod this way, and again, your pressure goes down like that. Okay, so I'm on now. It is different if you do an ALF when you have a huge cage. Yep. And I think that huge cage can help you can to reduce the number of the cases that you need to go to L4. But especially the way I do that with my smaller cage, I always uh, go to L4 to not only have uh, you know a longer construct, more screws, but as well to change the trajectory of the weight how it how it acts on the on the construct itself now yeah even when i wasn't doing um um alef i'm sorry when i even when i was doing alef i still would consider going to the levels above but obviously then i wouldn't put any cage here and definitely if you need 40 yes. minutes to put a cage here i wouldn't do that but it takes me literally five minutes to put another cage here so what I do at this time, obviously I put a cage here, I put a cage here, even though this is a normal thing, just to distribute the weight. You see, if I have a cage here, and then- With direct decompression or uh, you won't do direct decompression? Well, I don't do direct decompression. I just do a discectomy, prepare the end plates, and then- Press cam, yeah. I, And then imagine now, here is where your weight is going. Now, this lever action between four and five is by cage, mitigated by cage, and the pressure on the rod is not, literally, the pressure on the rod is not coming like if you would do it just the four, five, five S1. It wouldn't be at the sharp angle to S1. So it is some mechanical consideration. So I think um, yeah. you did a great job, Tony. And Sam, uh, on, quite honestly, knowing all my vascular surgeon here, I would do exactly what you said. I would have done it all posteriorly because I do not have good vascular surgeon here. Um, I actually consented the patient for an L45 ALF as well. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the medical aid or the insurance uh, did not uh, qualify okay. it. So, no, so we just like... Pictures? Do you yeah. have other post-op pictures that you can share with us? This is before the reduction. Because we did a CT run in the end. So I think this is. Yeah, that is, look at that. That is, you see, um, if you look at that, that is so much more, um, even though it, it, somebody could look at that and say, you barely reduced anything, that is yeah. reduced significantly. That is, Tremendously reduced. There. Yeah. So these reduction screws are quite, you can see it coming up. We use Globus reduction screws and you can see it being pulled up, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. reduction is this is a young person, strong, hard. 13, sorry, 13 years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, now obviously, you know, you try to do that on an elderly patient, you know, mm. you have to be extremely careful. Now, uh, what about? Um, have you done anything like that on elderly with the uh, with the not so much hard bone and so have you done anything like that on them? No, I don't remember. No, I don't think. List of us no, no. So, Bob, any comment on this? Have you done anything not like this on elderly? No, I I remember when I was in Galveston, we once did a reduction of almost spondylolisthesis. And uh, uh, we had actually a system of wires hooked to the ceiling, and we pulled on the did the wires on the screws to get it reduced. Wow, it was, it was I, crazy. I've never seen that. No. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I saw it just once, and it was enough. Yeah. But the, the patient healed actually. The patient healed. Yeah. No. So here, here the other orthopedic surgeon, my the rep was telling, he just. I don't see. I don't know if you've seen South African guys. They really huge, uh, so they just pulled the whole 
with their bare force in orthopedic uh, surgeons and same. Yeah, that, that's an option too. <laughs> yeah, I, I trained a gentleman who was the old school spine surgeons and he as a surgeon and he did all sorts of. Uh, I would say I saw things that you would normally see anymore, but they were actually. Yeah. yeah. Once, once there was a a case of a lady who who was involved in a car accident, got paralyzed below like T12, and uh, she was instrumented, and she was complaining that she is having difficulties having internal uh, intimate relationships with everything. So the the all the hardware came out, and because of the infection in like L3, uh, we did a combined anterior approach. Uh, so first, remove the hardware, clean it out, and clean it. Turn her around, but she was paralyzed. So you, you need to realize that when there was the the dual sac, and he actually cut the dual sac, uh, like under like L one or so, mm -hmm. tied it up, uh, mobilized the spine, resected one infected vertebral body, put a uh, I would say ten hole orthopedic plate into the spinal canal. So that uh, there would be a, a direct like fixation of the spine using the, 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 the plate directly there and mobilized her from the front and uh, removed that vertebral body complete and we shrunk her by the width of one vertebral body and put some hard like bone grafted there to fuse, fuse it and then we put then we put instrumentation into the back. It was crazy. It took 22 or three hours. Yeah. Wow. I want to share this and ask you a few more questions, sure. Tony, if you don't mind. Yes, now, sure, sure. I see that, you know, the, I don't see a P view of it. These are pedicle screws, right? They are not a yes. screws, correct? Pedicle screws, yes. Now, did you, in a case like that, do you ever consider to put S2 screws or additional a screws? And by the way, I never put alone ALR screws. The ALR screws as a backup, maybe, but ALR is the softest, the weakest part of the sacrum, right? So, yes. so, but did you consider to put either iliac crest screws or S2 screws or some other screws in a case like that? I mean, the, yeah. what's the backup? In, in, a, in a previous uh, case, I did all posterior L4 to iliac, you know? Uh, I've I've seen your ALR screws. There's a very good description uh, of yours uh, how to do it. Uh, thank you for that. But uh, I never try to do that. But I I just go iliac, so I can put a long big screw and then and connect yeah. the whole system. Yeah. Yeah, ALR screw is for me really. Um, uh, 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 Sam, what is your if you have to go two level below? What is the your uh, what is your preferred kind of S two AI? I, I prefer the S two AI. Yeah. Good. Those are good screws. Those are good screws. Um, can you describe your trajectory and so on? Let me get the, some uh, anatomical picture here. And uh, if you can, just describe your uh, trajectory for us a little. Let me get uh, that. So AI? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, I mean, we do it all navigation, uh, basically. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. But, we, we, but, but, you know, ob oblique <laughs> aim for the hip, basically, for the hip head uh, below like 45 degrees. And then uh, we're going to go like to the joint. You're going to feel the joint while you drill and then cortical bone, then keep drilling and then so, uh, go to the. So practically, hepatis. you start. You find uh, okay. Well, if you know for Amen between S1, S2 for Amen, a little bit be, uh, below the uh, yeah. S1 and, for Amen, and you go at almost very shallow, right? You go very yeah. shallow, and then, um, and that is a good place to do now. Obviously, imagine if you have a S1 pedicle screw, and I want to emphasize again, S1 pedicle screw should be considered the standard kind of way to do that. Alar screw goes more from medial to lateral, but Alar yeah. is a weak, you know, the spongiosa is almost empty there. So it is not a very strong screw, but as an additional, you know, you put the first screw here, which goes in, then the second screw right below it is still your right here, but then that one goes lateral mm -hmm. at about 30 degrees. So they are next to each other, almost they are next to each other. Now, the one you're describing, ALA, 
uh, or sacrum to uh, iliac it is uh, as you just described you know you can do it with navigation then you don't need to know anything <laughs> but uh, if you are going to do it in a traditional way you uh, identify uh, a swan foramen you go below it and then you almost what is that angle like 20 degree almost right very shallow very shallow i usually go i, I thought it's like 40 or something just like to aim for the hip, hip head but yeah sure yeah, yeah very shallow and the advantage is that with polyaxial, but then you have to have a, you have to choose your polyaxial screws properly because some polyaxial screw, they give you a, a, a adequate amount of motion. Some don't. Yeah. So I have failed a few times where the head of the screw wouldn't move enough to align the thing. So you have to yes. choose a polyaxial screw that gives you at least 60 degree motion on the head of the, yeah, I'm sure you guys know all the polyaxial screw uh, more or less are the same today, but they weren't the same when I was training. You had all variation that some polyaxial screw had less than others motion, and then some would move in one direction in the, the 30 degree, other direction, 45 degree. But the, I'm hoping that these days, these are not problems anymore that uh, 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 with what we are having. By the way, Mitch, can you please find out the LNK and the system we are devising, the polyaxial, how many degrees does it go in each direction? That need to be at least 55 to 60 degree. On can it. You find out? Okay, now, um, additionally, no, have you guys ever had that you put a, a sacrum to an iliac screw and patients yeah. after what they have a lots of um, sacroiliac pain and so on. Have you had any problem with that ever, or have you done this often enough to encounter that? No, I always feel the SI joint. So you do put some biologic there to yeah, yeah, always yeah. I drill it and I put it always. Fantastic idea. That's exactly yeah. what yeah. I wanted to say. Sam, if you do that, you know, just uh, you know, this is one of those things that. If you do that and you don't make the sacroiliac joint as well to fuse, you may cause them a lot of sacroiliac pain. So what I do, if I have to cross the sacroiliac joint or put, even put iliac screws, I just take a drill and yeah. drill on the sacrum and iliac crest and pack it with biologic mm -hmm. to cause additional sacroiliac joint fusion. And, and exactly, Tony, that's uh, so that prevent in the future, sacroiliac pain, but still some of them come back with significant sacroiliac problem. Um, now, the, the system we are going to have soon is actually what we call the iliac bolt, that in the where you do the sacro, sacral to iliac crest, we have this uh, iliac bolt that um, goes across the sacroiliac um, uh, goes across the iliac crest and like a bolt compression. Hold that, that. Have you guys had a chance to look at that? It's coming out. Mitch, when is it coming out? Oh, Mitch is... Sorry, which part of the system are you referring to? The iliac bolt, our, our screw system. When is it coming out? Uh, alpha launch targeted for October. October. Okay. Well, you know, I, I will uh, send you some uh, videos of that. It is... It's all, but the ad advantage here is completely MIS, you know, which I just feel about the iliac crest, one less two centimeter incision or one and a half centimeter incision, a piece goes in and then with the X-ray, you can see the eye of the bolt. I Let me see if I can find a video of that. It, it would be better. How is it uh, better or different from the lateral in terms of biomechanics? Or... The biomechanic is that because a bolt work with compression is two and a half yeah. times stronger than Strong. two. Okay. No, it is four times stronger than S2, and it is okay. two and a half times stronger than an uh, iliac screw, actually. Oh. Yeah. It is. I don't know. I don't. I don't know anything was stronger than the iliac screw. Oh the yeah. Longest screw. And because see, iliac screw is a screw. This is a bolt that goes compresses yeah. the iliac 
Okay. Uh, I'm trying to find a video of it. I have it somewhere. So, um, I, while you, you so uh, any other thing you want, I'm trying to find it while you're talking. So, any other so, uh, update? Uh, anything else? I can I think the present problem with a quick case. Oh, go ahead. I think the problem with the leg screws is we can't line it up to S1. But if if you I, I try to drill it under the ilium and I and I try to make it a bit proud, then we can actually uh, if we place it well, line it up. So you know to bend the rod, then I feel. Okay. Yeah. Now how often no okay, let talk since we are talking about that, what are your criteria? When do you consider to do a double uh, screwing in the you know in the S one S two iliac? What 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 is your criteria on that? Now, like if I'm going only posterior for that, uh, list this is out. I want to go to two level down, and or 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 if my I'm not happy with my S one screws, you know, and then I know my iliac screws uh, are definitely. Um. You know, no, you know that lots of people say if you do more above L three or L two, always double instrument in the, um, you know, on the bottom segment. Do you have a rule that you say, you know, that if I do this many segment, for me L two, L two, yeah. I think uh, there's there there's some people that just have uh, you know, uh, come up with some rules. Is that is that something they recommended somewhere, or are you doing it? Sam, are you doing it just intuitively? Intuitively, basically, this is what I hear mostly here. Yeah, L two to pelvis. I've done L one to S one, L two to S one, but you know the S one screws usually, as as we as we're talking, you know, uh, are not great. Just holding like, uh, especially big patients, and sometimes osteoporotic and. Uh... Okay, um, no. Have you heard about those people that I have seen that have never done that? And there's some in LinkedIn I see that that they do double rodding, and that mm, yeah, I've seen that. yeah, I was. What is that? You know, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. What they do? They do usual instrumentation, and then they make a long rod from the upper segment, connect it to the iliac instrumentation, but not to the rest of it. Right. Chris Ames does it all the time here at uh, UCSF. I, I don't understand. I mean, I don't do it, basically. I mean, they say, like, it just provides better support, but I, I, I didn't, like, find good data for that. Do you do it? Do you guys do it? No, I don't do it. I don't do it. Yeah, me neither. I don't. I'm trying to understand, to wrap my head around that, to see what is the justification or what is it, um, what is it that, you know, that makes it uh, advantageous or... No, I think the stress is uh, is is now in two. You know, it's like a building. If you have two rods, I think the stress is carried out. So, so this the failure would be less theoretically. So I'm sure there. There's also one Australian orthopedic spine surgeon who also does the same. Okay. LinkedIn, but yeah, but he posts those cases as well. So it's nice to see that that they are thinking laterally, literally, yeah. And, but well, but they but they're not but they're not doing MIs, uh, Doctor Basi. So, well, no, my, the one I'm going to it's show. Open, open. I'm trying to find it. Um, we have this system that is all MIs. Mitch, do you have by any chance access to that video? I'm trying to find the, the um that iliac bolt video. If you look in the chat and, for for this Zoom call here. I included a link that should go to the LinkedIn post that you made with that animation. I think Excellent. that's what you Thank you. You are here. Okay. Let me, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mitch. Okay. So this is the MIS system that we are having now. Practically, you make oh, yeah. one, two centimeter incision above the iliac crest. You push this down. And you, there is a caliper, or you can use the X-ray. You put a, a guide wire through the eye of that um, iliac bolt. And as you see here, you know then what size thing to use. And it goes through the eye of the bolt. 
and practically then the cannulated screw goes across and as you see it compresses the iliac crest because it's worked with compression we have measured that our biomechanical studies show it is about two and a half times stronger than iliac crest screw and four times stronger than like a S2 screw. Okay, now, once you have done that, you uh -huh. have just an additional, you just have an additional tulip that you have to pass the rod through. We did it on a cadaver. It doesn't take any longer than put a um, pedicle screw. It takes the same amount of time. And then the only thing is that you put, you need to put your S1 screw a little proud, about a centimeter proud, then you don't have to put a huge bend in your rod. But as well, if if you, this is uh, the polyaxial thing, meaning that you can actually bend it, that you can as well uh, put a huge bend, but then your bend is going to be almost 90 degree. But if you put about the S1 screw about a centimeter proud, then the bend is about 35 to 40 degree. It's very, very doable. And I think the advantage is to, number one, it's all MIS. And number two, you can do this with a caliper. You can do it even without the X-rays. You know, um, and, the, the, and the, the mechanical strength of it, in, at least in our test, has been truly tremendous. It's very, very strong. Now, the disadvantage very here is, the disadvantage here is, Tony, that yeah. you don't drill on the sacroiliac joint and you're not, but you're not injuring it either. You're mm -hmm. far do you feel, from it. Do you feel like in a uh, like very thin patient that might be an issue just where, where they sit on mm -hmm. their butt or would it be cr uh, proud or? No, it won't be actually. No, in my, most of the patient when we did the study, do you see how far it's up? This uh -huh. is very far up. Now, if you do it right, push it down until it doesn't go anymore, you, you cannot feel that. It's not going to be proud, especially not on the American patient population. They are quite low. <laughs> Right. Or, or South African. Or South African, yeah. Now, maybe maybe on Japanese patient would be... <laughs> so, in most of patients, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, Another thing that's coming out actually in a few months at the same time, um, do, uh, do you have... Um, uh, uh, Mitch, do you have the link to our extension ready screw that I want to show that as well, if you can, just as a last thing. I will look with no promises. Okay. I, I've seen that. It's quite amazing. Yeah. 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 That is as well, something coming out. I'm so excited about that because right now I do three level fusion on 90 years old people, send them home next day. But the problem yeah. is many of these 80, 90 year old people, they don't need three level fusion. They need a six level fusion. And next time they come back, I cannot do all MIS. Yeah. But now with our uh, truly, if we can do uh, all in our MIS, that would be truly amazing if we could do the next surgery as well MIS. Spired spine. So this bowl system have we used on a lot of patients? Sorry, now? I have to jump to a different meeting. Okay. Sorry. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Nice to meet you. Nice uh, meeting. Nice meeting you too. Bye. Uh, Dr. Abbasi, have you used the bolt system on, on patients? The extension, the, this bolt? No, I haven't. Yeah. FDA approved yet. We have used it on cadaver and we have used it on our, at our um, um, as, you know, for our studies. We have done finite element model tests and so on, but we have not used it on the patient yet. But hopefully okay. toward the end of the year, we will be able to do that. Yeah, no, because I'm in an academic hospital, so we can approve for some study if you want. Wow, absolutely, Mitch. You want to just connect and see if they can get, 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 allow us to use it. But you know, you you have seen the details, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that I would love to have a multicenter study on that. 
the mechanical test came back fantastic. Yeah, yeah, Change that's fine. Few things. It is actually. It seems to be. We made few changes. It seems to be twice as strong as the current system we are using right now. Okay. It used to be like you know seventy percent of the strength of the system we are using right now. We made some changes. Now it made it four hundred percent stronger in the last meeting we had. And you know, obviously, we will share all those the results and so on with you. But yeah, that would be great if you could uh, have a multicenter study. Oh, okay. We are, we, are, we are part of an American head injury trial in the so it's it helps. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, it is almost eleven o'clock. I would say thank you so much for sharing that case with us, Tony. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Mitch. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.